All right, we are live. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> I'm with Mark Grobay. How are you? Uh, Grobear. How are you doing, Mark? Why do I always want, want to push your name? I don't know why. Like Stephen Colbert. Mark Grobear. Okay. I know, but I would never want that association because he's kind of... I'm only using it for pronunciation purposes. <laughs> I mean, remember when, when Colbert was actually funny back in the old days when he, you know, was with... Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something. Where is Jon Stewart? Hmm. You know, I actually saw John Stewart released a movie recently. Um, might have been 2020. It was not bad. It was kind of a good central political movie. Oh, right. You're talking about the movie, his interrogation uh, Middle East movie. No, 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 no. It was a movie. It's fiction. He, he directed right. it. Right. First time I mean, directing and all that. It's about a guy who gets apprehended by. No, 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 no. It was, uh, it was a second movie. Oh, it must be a second then. Yeah, he. Okay. Uh, it was about a guy who lives in the country with his daughter, and he's a Marine, and he makes a statement to the crowd, and wow. uh, Steve Carell, a cynical political operator, said, oh, this is the next Democrat we have to have to go forward. And I must have missed this. I didn't even hear that. I must it's, have it's really recent. It's really recent. Well, the first one was watchable, that's for sure. I think he, he wants to be a film director now, you know, which is I a think good so. idea. You know, for him, as Hollywood completely collapses and um, there's no entertainment industry left. I think it, he probably feels a little bit of responsibility for some of what's going on, even though I'm not going to blame him completely. He sort of started that whole fashion of the, I don't know how to put it, the style of just, just the mocking end of it. Well, the snarkiness. and Yeah, uh, yeah it's... It was very dark. I met him a couple of times. I mean, he's a very sharp, quiet guy, you know, normally. And uh, but so, so many of them are. I mean, uh, the show was highly watchable for a long time. But sure. out of that, we got Colbert, who is just clearly a political operative. Right. At that point, right. You know, which is where I was going with this thing. You know. Yeah. And that's the thing about John Stewart is, I mean, he obviously, you know, he sides on one side or another, but a couple differences. One, he was funny. Two, mm -hmm. he was smart. Right. That right there, you know, puts him a league above everybody who's on late night. Well, not only that, he was a great stand-up, too, which most of those cats are not. Uh, Stewart came from stand-up. If you think about the other guys, which is what a, where Bill Maher came from, which what we were talking about yesterday about Bill yeah. Maher, um, semi-149 degree turn into something, you know, which we're not sure what was going on there. But he has, um, he has been a contrarian for a long time, Bill Maher. You know, basically, he's a contrarian. Well, Bill Maher and Dennis Miller, I think, go well together. Yes, right. They're a little bit the a little bit off the center of each other, mm -hmm. and they're both. I don't know how to put this, but when we were growing up, what we would refer to as Bill Maher would be a Jersey asshole. <laughs> that's that's kind of where this guy is at, and you know, I, like I said to you, I've met him a couple of times, and he's got. Not a very good reputation in this town for what he is and has done mm. here. I mean, he's the kind of guy that in a in a meeting with his writers hit one of the writers in the face with a piece of fried chicken because he didn't like the joke. Oh, good he's, he's a guy who has a semen towel wrangler and a complete leather bound collection of Playboy and Masturbates before each show. That's that's who okay. Bill Maher is, just in case you don't know. <laughs> okay, well, I we all know. We all know, but you don't know, Eric, because you're, uh, you, you're correct. You're what we call a civilian. <laughs> yes. In, um, in our world, we know all the dirt <laughs> about people like Bill Maher. How about Norm MacDonald? Do you Norm, know Norm MacDonald? One of the, first of all, I don't. I, I've seen him a couple of times. One of the funniest stand-ups of all time. Unbelievable great stand-up. No, I, I don't know his private life or anything, but... Mm -hmm. um, That's part of why he's funny. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I feel, I'm trying to think back. I've just seen him perform a couple of times at, at Benefits, but wow, wow, is he incredible. Well, uh, I brought him up because he made the point to Larry King, which I thought was very interesting about Bill Maher and Dennis Miller, that, and especially Bill Maher, he said that there are comedians who want to prove that they're smarter than everybody. Right. And he said, whereas Dave Letterman is smarter than both of them, right. Bill Maher and Dennis Miller, 
but he plays the everyman or the dummy. So the last thing you want to be is smarter than your audience. Everybody will hate you. Well, it, it, nothing could be more of an example of that is when Bill Maher met with Joe Rogan. Because mm. here's Joe Rogan, doesn't need Bill Maher. Bill Maher's acting all arrogant and everything. And <laughs> Rogan is humble, and he says, you're one of my heroes. And it just keeps getting worse and worse as he feeds this narcissistic uh, album to, <laughs> to Maher, who just says, yeah, I booked myself. I wanted to come down here and see what all this fuss is about, about you and all oh, your God. 10 million followers. And I'd like you to come on my show. And, and <laughs> Rogan has no interest to go on Bill Maher's show. And he's there trolling for guests. And it's really obvious what Maher is doing. And it, the whole half of that show, if you want to see Bill Maher, the first half of that show is Bill Maher defensive. The second half, he kind of loosens up a little bit. But his guard is up for the entire first half of that interview. He doesn't you know, want that's, that's the brilliance of the three-hour Rogan format. Yes, yes. It, it really is. Because it's like, no matter who they are, it, it would almost be a neat experiment to do that and then just cut off the uh, first half of the show every time because by the time, it, you know, he, he wears them down. Right. Um, you know, between... Oh, well, he wore them down with kindness. He, I mean, he was... And he is, he means it. I mean, this guy was one of his heroes. You know, he wasn't oh, yeah. he wasn't bullshitting Bill Maher, but Maher just kept eating it up. <laughs> it was kind of funny. I, I, I just I find it one of the best Rogan interviews of all time, you know. All right, well, let's start with it because you almost went, um, got a job with Bill Maher. And I know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let, tell um, us about this interview. What went down? Yeah, I'm only thinking about it because of what went down with Maher this weekend. Richard Lewis, who's a close friend of mine, is a, uh, sent me for this job interview, called up Bill Maher, I guess, to put it together. <laughs> and uh, just so your audience knows, it's not a job interview as we know it. It's not an interview, a sit-down interview. It's a little bit different. So when you show up for this thing, they prep you. On Thursday nights, he has a live audience dress rehearsal for the oh. night after. And you are expected to play the role of one of the guests. Now, this is all told to me on Wednesday. <laughs> on okay. Thursday, I'm supposed to go in and become Ariana Huffington. As a guest on the show. And I'm saying, do I have to do the voice? I mean, how much of Huffington do I have to be? Politically Huffington? They won't explain it. It's part of their game, their psychological game. At least it wasn't Coulter. Right. No, no. I, again, I, you know, I have to be Ariana Huffington. So you go in and there's a live audience and it looks like something like out of network, the movie with Sybil the Soothsayer or Peter Finch, you know, hosting a new show. And you're there with two other writers who are playing two of the other guests. So you, there's th two writers, myself, playing the three guests. Mar shows up without makeup. Looks like he's completely hungover. I mean, a bulbous nose. It's terrifying to look at. You're seeing <laughs> him being worked on for hours when you see him on HBO wow. on every night. Yeah, it, I went like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So anyway, so the show, you don't know what you're supposed to do, you know. So he's doing his monologue and whatever he's doing, sitting behind this desk when they had the little thing there. And um, I'm watching him. I'm just getting spaced out watching him do his thing, right? Mm -hmm. and, all of, and he's talking about um, changing cars to, I guess it was one of Huffington's things, to helium or some sort of natural gas cars. This oh, is oh, 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 hydrogen. Hydrogen, uh, hydrogen. capitals. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Apparently, this was one of her things. Yeah. Yes. So at some point, he turns to me. Now, there's cameras shooting this, and there's a live audience, Eric. It's a little <laughs> disconcerting for a job interview, as you can imagine. So, <laughs> so all of a sudden, he turns and looks at me out of the blue. This is after 20 minutes. And he says, So, Ariana, what do you, how do you think that we should get enough hydrogen? to supply all the cars in the in the country, I said, obviously, we're going to have to invade a planet with hydrogen to take it over. <laughs> the audience catches me off guard, explodes with laughter, and it's like a delay, and I'm kind of taken aback, and he's glaring at me. <laughs> you mean, just you upstaged him. I just upstaged him. It wasn't intentional. I just said the first thing that popped into my head, saying we're, have to, we're going to have to invade a planet that has a lot of hydrogen. 
And then he was just daggers. He asked me a second follow-up question, which I forget. It was the same kind of reaction. Complete explosion by the audience into cacophonous laughter, right? right? The show ends. Everybody disappears. I am completely radioactive. A, a woman comes up to me and gives me a gift basket with some cheese and wine in it and directs me to a back elevator, which is a freight elevator. Consolation like, prize. Nobody tells me if I've got the job. Nothing. I, and no one will go near me, Eric. So I'm just completely depressed. I wander through the halls. This is over at uh, CBS in, in, uh, in Hollywood um, by Fairfax. So I'm wandering through the halls, the freight elevator in the back opens up, and lo and behold, it's Bill Maher. <laughs> he, says, he said, how the hell did you get here, by the way? And I said, Richard Lewis, a mutual friend recommended me. And he says, great line, a lot of good that did you. And he walked away and closed the door, and that was the end of my interview. I didn't get the job. <laughs> Did he, uh, Richard get any feedback? He did from me because he kept sending me to all these jobs where it was one disaster after another. He did the same thing with The Daily Show. He sent me for a job to New York. The oh, Daily wow. Show. They made me stay an extra five days. And after the fifth day, they said, we can't see you. And I flew back to L.A. And again, I just went berserk on Richard Lewis. I would just call him up and start screaming at him, you know, because he does this. I mean, he means well, Eric. He means well, but he doesn't perceive that not everybody takes him as seriously as I do. Put it that way. All right. Well, this is perfect. And I hope everybody understands that this is going to be a scattershot just chat because yeah, you have we such a, unstructured, a background. Maybe. Unstructured. That, exactly. Yeah, and I'm going to live up to the name here. Uh, I, I have no way which way to go or anything else. So let's jump in. Uh, Gonzo Journalism. Right. So, okay. So, you know, when I grew up, my heroes were like Hunter Thompson and the Beats. And when I became a journalist, um, I worked for the LA Weekly as an investigative reporter from like 94 to let's say, you know, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. Were you and, tied in with uh, uh, Gary Webb at all? No, Gary Webb was at the Mercury, uh, San oh, sorry. Mercury News, which is all the way up by San Francisco. The okay. LA Weekly is like the Village Voice. It's the same company in New York as Village Voice and LA Weekly. Okay, but, sorry. Uh, For some reason. Yeah. I anyway, but I uh, just to back up in a little bit, I started from magazines. Like I told you the other day, I was an editor at National Lampoon Magazine. Right. I had replaced PJ O'Rourke as kind of the political editor after O'Rourke was fired with others in what was termed the Saturday Night Massacre, where <laughs> Matty Simmons fired the entire staff. And yeah, that was in the 80s, right? Yeah, that was 85. So I, I came in in 85. I'd gone to a place um, called Bard College as a, as a college student, which is a small liberal arts school up the Hudson, which Walter Winchell in the 1950s called the Little Red Whorehouse on the Hudson. <laughs> it, was, it was three three to one girls, and they were all communists. It was a great school, Eric. It was I'm a great sure. school. Yeah. Anyway, so when I went to Lampoon, I started to do a lot of parody stuff, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today was parody, yeah. comedy, satire, and parody. Uh, three things. The reason it comes to mind is because of the Babylon B story where they're being sued for not oh. being a parody. Did oh, it's re it's beyond ridiculous uh, in that. Uh, yeah. Um, and not only that, there's fact checkers who are checking a parody site. Right, exactly. So I just want to get into what parody is because a lot of your audience. Yeah. Not well, and I want to know the difference between uh, parody and satire. So let's right, I'm going to explain that. As a professor of comedy, I am going okay. to explain. I'm going to explain that to you because there, there is a big difference. Now, if you look at the Onion, that's also just headline parody. There's no body <laughs> for that. It's like a poor man's national lampoon. It's just headlines with no story. We could do that all day if that was our desire, but we actually had to write stories. And when we were at Lampoon. National Lampoon, what we learned was how to parody mainstream publications. We would do a Not the New York Times, an entire issue of the New York Times in that style, in that style. We would do a Cosmopolitan magazine parody as Cosmopolitan in their style. It's, it's very subtle, 
But that's we did a TV guy parody, you know, all the different parodies that Lampoon did. I, I'm interrupting and I apologize. We'll jump back in. But Mad Magazine, would that also qualify for that? Because they Mad did Magazine of- also did a broad based parody of okay. items, right? What we did was a far more intellectual version of that. <laughs> I, right? hope I mean, when, you, when you're putting out an entire not uh, issue of the New York Times, Eric, sure. and putting it on the newsstands in Manhattan, thousands mm-hmm. of copies that people are picking up and it becomes a news story that you've actually printed the New York Times right. and put it on new select newsstands and in small print it says not the New York Times. <laughs> That's a little bit more work. That took us months and months to do. Did you do the yeah. New Yorker too? Well, oh yeah, many times. Yeah. Okay. We did the New Yorker. <laughs> you got to get to the high. We did the Bible. Eric, we did the Bible. We did oh. not the Bible. Okay. Nice. <laughs> but Anyway, getting back to parody, I'll give an example of the, what's going on with the Onion versus the Babylon Bee. They're absolutely the same mirror image politically. Sure. I mean, well, they're just on the other side of the coin. So I did a thing called Mass Murder of Baseball Cards, right? So it's a parody of baseball cards in 1985. Nobody had ever done this before. I saw the Associated Press had listed the top mass murderers in America as if they were the top home run leaders. Like, you see, like, Babe Ruth, 714. Right, so G- Gary Ridgway is uh, number one with the most uh, kills. and Right, and they had him in descending order, just like you would yeah. see the AP style for mm-hmm. a baseball home run king, which gave mm-hmm. me the idea to do baseball cards of each mass murderer. <laughs> so this became a cause celeb in the media. Nobody had ever done this before. Now they're everywhere. This card's everywhere for everything. There were no trading cards. It didn't exist. And this whole thing, we put a lot of research into it on the back. We had little cartoons, their statistics, how many they killed, just like a baseball card. Right, right, that's right. A parody, that's a parody. That's not satire. That's a direct artistic parody of baseball cards. Okay. But just to give you an example, I'll give you another example. I did a parody, and this may be more relevant. I did a parody of Jeopardy, the game, the game TV game show. Mm-hmm. And it was called Sexual Jeopardy, the home game. It was legitimately just like Jeopardy, right? But it was <laughs> Sexual Jeopardy, the home game. Later, Howard Stern would use it on his show and read, because I had the questions and answers, you know, just sure, like sure. A, to the board game. And we got sued by Merv Griffin. Merv Griffin took us to federal court saying this was a copyright infringement mm. of his ownership of the copyright on the show Jeopardy. So I mention this as a great example, and this might be for Fry and, and your friend Barnes, who might well, yeah, love it's it. into fair use and all that, too. I mean, literally, right. because, because you're critiquing them by parody in a lot of ways. Right. So what I'm getting at is the federal judge in his robes in the court when we were there was reading my stuff, laughing out loud, and threw it out the case for parody, actually citing parody from the federal bench. You know what I love about that is it would almost be worth going through the case just to watch the judge have to do that. Right. I know. <laughs> he was like, reading it, and he and he wasn't expressing his face, so we went, we didn't know. Then he just cracked up laughing, and I just said, all right, this is over. And he threw it out for parody. So that that's a, a firsthand example of... Okay. Parody versus satire, you know. Satire. Okay, so what is satire? Satire would be like Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce, you know, doing a political uh, take on things that's satirical, but not a parody of it. Um, okay, so a parody is something that exists that you're mimicking or mocking. You're and mimicking. Satire is created from cold cloth, possibly. Right, right, right. A satire is, is something that's your point of view, your take on a political event or a social event um, okay. that, like Lenny Bruce did, you know, let me just, Christ and Moses, right? Christ and Moses come down to St. Patrick's Cathedral, real bit he did, right? It's called Christ mm-hmm. and Moses, very famous bit. And they appear in St. Patrick's Cathedral and they're from coming from the past. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. What do they do in there? They want to talk to Bishop Sheen and Cardinal Cook and see why there's 400 uh, this, there's room for 400 people in this chapel and Puerto Ricans are living up in Spanish Harlem, 82 a room. Why can't they live here? You know, so they end up calling Rome and they, and he says, what am I paying protection for? He gets the Pope on the phone, becomes a whole crazy bit, right? From, from Lenny Bruce. But that's a satire. That's a satirical take on the Catholic church is what he was doing. That's a whole different animal. Neither one of these animals exists today at all. 
is the reason that I'm talking to you. Neither satire nor parody is allowed to exist in this McCarthyistic new space that we live in now. Yeah, that, and and that is a concern because I, I'll be honest, I, I like the Babylon Bee headlines. So did I. I like some of the Onion headlines too. So do I. So do but I. But I actually, I feel like we're in a weird state where half the real headlines could have been written by either one. Right. There's a lot of parody. There's a lot of headlines that somebody just was printing. I don't know if it was Glenn Greenwald or Matt Taibbi that looked like parody headlines, but they're actually true that I was yeah. reading the other day. And it was hard to tell what's true and what's not. Yeah. And, and, and so I am curious about that because, I mean, you come from the world of comedy. Do you not see um, now people and articles and you just read them and and you're like they're actually writing this with a straight face i mean they're they're unironically okay. writing some of the just in keep in mind keep in mind there was no uh a chuckles <laughs> laugh factory in berlin in 1939 stalin did not have a comedy club right mao did not mm -hmm. have mao's comedy bunker there's a reason that comedy is not allowed in totalitarian regimes it's because it's indefensible on the part of the other side. They would have to have equal, when we were growing up in New York, you'd have like 30 kids and we'd rank each other out. We'd go at each other with, with satire and parody and knocking each other back and forth. And this right. was, allowed us to sharpen our comedy chops, right? This mm -hmm. was a game that everybody did. That side, their side does not want to play that game. So they mm -hmm. have killed the court jester. The court jester was able to dance up to the toes of the king, mock the king, walk a thin line. The king would laugh and the king would never kill the court jester. In any any government you've ever seen involving a king in the Middle Ages, anyone that had a court jester, the reason the court jester was there was so that people could laugh through the court jester while living under a monarchy. Mm. They want to kill the court jester. And that is going to disconnect them from the people itself. That's what Stalin did. That's what Hitler did. That's what Mao did. It's the same exact dance. The allowing of comedy allows the truth to come through. The, as you see every week on Saturday Night Live, the last person they're going to mock is Joe Biden. Right. A guy that I could write bits for in my underwear in the morning and mail them in and get paid. That's how easy it is. Well, that, that's what... What bothers me about it is it's so lazy. You you mentioned Colbert earlier, right? And I feel like all the bits are literally da 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 Trump. Ha ha ha. It's like there's no joke there. He's a funny guy. There's a ton of things to make fun of, but they're not making fun of them him. It, it's just it's so lazy. Right. Well, the Trump era is over, so now the Biden era comes in. And I'll tell you this story because I think it might be relative relative. Sure. Um Joe Kennedy hired Mort Saul to be a joke writer for his son, Jack Kennedy, when he was running in 1960 against Nixon. So on the campaign trail, Jack Kennedy is spouting all these very funny witticisms. They come from Mort Saul, the original political satirist, uh, 1959. He's working on the Kennedy campaign. 1960, Kennedy beats Nixon. Uh, Joseph Kennedy goes to Mort Saul and says, I'd like to hire you to stay on in the White House to continue to write jokes for my son as the president of the United States. Mm. Right? Mort Saul looks at him. He says, you got to be shitting me. Are you kidding me? He said, I am now the loyal opposition, sir. This is what <laughs> Saul said. And that's what Colbert should have said. That's what Bill Maher should have said. And all of these guys who revere Mort Saul deserve to take it up the ass because they <laughs> did not do what Mort Saul did. Mort Saul said, there's not a question in my mind of working for the president of the United States. Not because I dislike Jack Kennedy. It's because right. it's not my job. My job is to speak truth to power through comedy and satire. And that's what Saul told him. And Joseph Kennedy said, fair answer. I will now dedicate my life to destroying your career. Which is <laughs> no, no, that's absolutely true. Oh, God. So, I mean, Saul told me this in an interview. I did a cover story on Mort Saul for, for a magazine. Oh, wow. And, you know, and then he came at him. He just kept coming at him, to, uh, Kennedy, through different means, you know. But the point of the matter is, here was a guy at the top of his game, Mort Saul, Stephen Colbert of his era, and he just told the president's father to go fuck yourself. <laughs> it didn't make him an Eisenhower supporter. 
You know what I'm saying? It didn't make him a Trump supporter. Sure, sure. Uh, he just said, I'm not working for the most powerful man on earth to write jokes. Right. That's what I was trying to explain to you. No, no, no. It makes sense. And by the way, a call back to Norm MacDonald. I feel like he's very much the same type of personality. Same with Corolla. Uh, I mean, uh, Adam also. Do you know Corolla? I, I know him just through Dr. Drew because, you know, he does a show. Oh, with him. I mean, right. I, I haven't met Corolla, but I go over to that studio all the time. So, you know. Okay. Yeah. Corolla, definitely that way. But yeah, Norm, I mean, especially in his prime, <laughs> uh, he, he would go for the jugular. I mean, Simpson, whoever. Right. And that's what you're supposed to do. That's the point I'm trying to make. When you see SNL, which I haven't seen in decades, you know, uh, Gilbert Gottfried called it a famous old restaurant in a good location as, <laughs> as a denunciation of SNL. But I mean, here is low hanging fruit, Eric, of Joe Biden. Right. Mm -hmm. I can make this, like I said, you can make jokes of this all day long. But for political totalitarian and socialistic communist reasons, they will not attack this empty suit. Now, that is terrifying. That's a new take in American com comedy politics. That's a new situation. We have never experienced this before. They went light on Obama, but there were still people making jokes about Obama. It wasn't a 100 percent shutout. Yeah, it was thin on the ground, but yeah. It was thin, but not like this. <laughs> you not know, it's like funny. This. I want to ask you, because we're both um, Xers, essentially, and back in the day, Reagan was the enemy right. in, in the 80s. Right. And do you find yourself not, where you almost have to look back and be charmed by Reagan? In re retrospect, now I do. I mean, I look, I, <laughs> again, I, I, you know, I'm a liberal Democrat. The party moved to, the, to, to, to Mao's basement while I was busy having a career. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up and all of a sudden there's jackboots marching through Los Feliz with, with swastikers on. You know, I mean, like, when did this happen? You know, I, 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 went, I took a nap. I woke up. It was Berlin, 1933. You know, I mean, I've had riots and right in front of my door here, you know, of, of Black Lives Matter and Antifa, you know, going on a reign of terror here. You know, I mean, they've become the new brown shirts to the left. These mm -hmm. guys are their brown shirts. They're their shock troops. You know, that's what we're up against here. When when someone like Maxine Waters could airlift herself into Minneapolis oh and to riot if she doesn't like the verdict. I mean, what are we up against here? You Did know, you what? see the um the um after the closing instructions what the judge said? After the closing instruction before the prosecution's closing arguments or no, 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 after all of the closing arguments. No, no, I'm in the middle right after I, the instructions to the jury when he sent them off to deliberate. I didn't see it yet. No, I didn't see it. I just TV. Okay. It. Well, he oh. did tell Eric Larson he said that uh she may have given you the appeal. I know. I know, but it should have been a mistrial. I well I don't know because here here's the question. Depending on where people fall. A mistrial isn't necessarily in Chauvin's favor. No, no, I'm not saying it yeah, is. You know, or, or whatever. Well, so Not expanding the jury pool past 250 people. You know, I mean, there was a situation here in L.A. I'll just give you a, a, an example. Mm -hmm. When the Rodney King thing happened, the editor at KTLA and the producer looked at the film footage, the video footage they got. Sure. And in the first five minutes of the footage, the top of the footage, top of the feed, is five minutes of King flipping them around like 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 King Kong in a movie, throwing them off of himself violently. Mm -hmm. They he just was on PCP. what's that? He was on PCP, if I recall. He was drunk and he was on PCP, but I'm saying he yeah. he was in the beginning of the footage, the filmed footage. Right. He's flinging them like they're toy soldiers. That's why they went to the swarm, right? Sure, that's what the swarm is about. Okay. So the editor of KTLA and the producer decide to cut off the head of that footage. They make a decision. They win an Emmy Award for it. And the city of Los Angeles burns to the ground. So when the jury sees that footage, they're outraged. And they realize that these guys had to be acquitted. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar story here. You know, with, with, the, with the body cam footage and the previous footage of, of uh, uh, Floyd being arrested in 2019, and the body cam footage of the other cop, all withhold, withheld by the media. So when the jury sees it for the first time, as Barnes has pointed out, a lot of times it provokes anger on the part of the jury that they've been duped. Sure. Anyway, that's what happened with Rodney King, but it cost the city of LA, you know, something like $5 billion in damages by these two schmucks deciding to cut that footage. That's the point I'm trying to make. 
two knuckleheads in the media. See, I believe that we need a amendment to the First Amendment. I believe that there there is the 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 ability to not be protected for free speech by shouting fire in a crowded theater, right? Well, I mean, yeah, that that isn't the same thing. I mean, uh, technically, I, right. I mean, what that, I'm suggesting that's, um, is a call to action, if you will. Right. What I'm suggesting is what they're doing is the digital equivalent of shouting fire in a crowded theater while hiding yeah. behind the guise of the First Amendment. Yeah, but here's the problem. Who's going to prosecute them when they're in bed well, no, I, with the right. local prosecutor? You know, I, I'm, I'm saying that there was a point of time. Yeah. You were right. And and they would have been held out or hung out to dry by the locals in that case. Um, even if it was just a case of like, OK, they do that. The police would freeze them out like, OK, you're never going to get a single story from us again. No cop is ever going to talk to you about even on that lowest level. But nobody is doing it because they're in bed with half of the uh, prosecutors. I, I know um, Emily D. Baker, who's been on the channel a couple of times. Mm -hmm. She was a former ADA out there, uh, L.A. area. And she said they can't stand that D.A. Oh, They're Gaston, trying to yeah. get him out. He, he's okay. a complete activist and right. dirty. Uh, I mean, just beyond horrible. Beyond. There, there was nothing wrong with the previous DA. I mean, the idea that Black Lives Matter would turn against a black woman DA and embrace a white Cuban born in Havana to be the district attorney of Los Angeles. If you would have told me that five years ago, I would have laughed out loud. But they well, were because it, that's because Black Lives Matter as an organization is a communist organization. Right. It doesn't we don't really that. care about the blacks. And, and you know, like, uh, I forgot, um, oh, I feel terrible, but. Uh, the, the girl who died in Kentucky, her mother um, has come out saying, Breonna Black Taylor? Lives, yes, Breonna Taylor's mother has come out saying, hey, BLM has nothing to do with me. I have nothing to do with them. They're essentially seen as carpetbaggers um, for a, a legitimate cause some of the time. Well, we have a new neighbor here in Topanga, a woman who bought a house here, the uh, the co-founder of BLM. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it. it's a nice house. Yeah. I mean, it's a great road. It's a great street. Um, I, Real estate's I, down there. Has to be because you guys have a mess, right? Right. I'm sure <laughs> she, I'm sure every house on Topanga went on sale the next morning. They had their real estate agents immediately on speed dial. I, I couldn't imagine how fast they're selling their homes over there now to get out. And uh yeah, it's it's really bizarre. I assume they're going to, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, a couple months ago, I tried to find out where their headquarters were. And I traced it to a post office store, a postal store. And each city has a uh, UPS store with a mailbox for Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. checks. And a guy mm -hmm. shows up at five o'clock and takes the checks out of the little postal box and takes mm -hmm. them somewhere. That, this is an organization that has a, a, over $100 million in corporate donations operating out of a post office box in Seattle, Chicago, and New York. With no like drug dealers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no central office, Eric. There's no place to go. You know, I mean, it's a little unusual. But well, Antifa is even worse because there is no technically, or Boogaloo Boys. Boogaloo Boys are kind of the most wild out of the lot. There is no organization. It's like, hey, you got a Hawaiian shirt and a gun? Come on over. You know, I'm working <laughs> it's, on it, yeah. I'm working on a dark comedy about Antifa right now as a script, uh, okay. kind of like Network Meets Idiocracy. And so I'm reading Andy Noe's book, and um, one of the best scenes in the book is they're in the middle of a riot, and the truck comes by, one of those taco trucks, blasting uh, uh, power to the people, and they all take a break from the rioting and sit down and order and have like Che Guevara platters and the Castro burger and, and put their shields down. And I said, this is a comedy. This is this is network, Eric. I mean, so anyway, it's a project I'm working on right now in terms of screenplay. Well, there are some, I mean, in the more organized areas that people are paid to come in. I yeah. Mean, oh, it yeah. is it is literally I, I mean you've been in the movie industry forever, and I figure that they're just kind of like extras, they get a day rate. Right. You know, <laughs> that, you know what? <laughs> they might even be in the protest union. Which is a, you know, it's, it's like the screen is for the major players, but there might be a minor thing like the SAG Extra Guild, yeah. you know, yeah. where they just get the Che Guevara platter. <laughs> they, you know, it, by the way, they changed the code on all the bathrooms. They had the managers change the code to all cops are bastards, A-C-A-B. 
the, 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 so they could use the bathroom during a riot. You can't make this up. I, I mean, I'm telling you, this is a dark comedy. You know, <laughs> every night it's time to, I mean, if you saw their daily life, you know, like, all right, five o'clock, we got to get going, Bobby. Get the shield, get the helmet. Come on, let's go ahead and over. Where is it? Same place every night. They, I mean, it's almost like they're spraying lighter fluid on the same building like they do in a movie set, you know, to do take 23 courthouse on fire. It's the same building every night. <laughs> I, I, I just you want to fly on Maria, the I have though. Um, it? Technically, that would be a satire, right? Your uh, script. Technically, that's a satire. You're right, Eric. Now you're learning. Oh, okay. You'll, you'll take the master's course. Oh, that's why I'm here, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get the master's thesis course in this. <laughs> but, look, but my my worry would be, what do you do every time you write it out, and then the damn thing happens for real? Look, that's not that's not completely insane. If you look, I at, know that. If you look at Network <laughs> now, the movie which I recently looked at again. It looks like a documentary. I mean. It, you know what I mean? It's not that far fetched. And China, no, I know. That's what I said. I'm, I'm saying it's a legitimate problem. <laughs> right. Even idiocracy looks like a it's, documentary now. Yeah. Look, where we are now is we have a situation which I consider to be an extension of War of the Worlds, the radio broadcast by Orson Welles that frightened a lot mm -hmm. of people. It's War of the Worlds, the radio show on steroids. Okay. Mixed in with PTSD. Now with the with these people who are being asked or or suggested to take their masks off, they completely now have complete PTSD because the media, like Orson Welles, War of the Worlds, which only happened one night. This has happened for four hundred and fifty consecutive nights of War of the Worlds. If that makes it's sense, continuous. Oh, sure. Right. I mean, some people committed suicide during the War of the Worlds. There were people drinking. That people did crazy crap. This is five hundred or four hundred consecutive nights of War of the Worlds, in my humble opinion. So now you have a phobia about removing the masks or seeing people without a mask on. That's one aspect of it. You have a post-traumatic stress disorder situation uh, at the end of this thing. And now, from what I was talking to Dr. Drew about, I said, what I'm hearing is tens of thousands of girls, and mostly girls, but guys too, are completely addicted to benzodiazepine, Xanax, and Valium, mm -hmm. who prescribed it during the crazy time of the past year. And to get off of those drugs is really difficult. So I think we've created, just like in the Civil War with morphine, we created over 2 million morphine addicts after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. They were handing it out like jelly beans. You know what I mean? Uh, well, hey, hey, the pharmaceutical companies are doing great, man. I mean, they've got that, they've got vaccines. I mean, right. it, it's a good deal. Right. A good deal. I mean, and, and think about it. Uh, you've well, we'll go back to Corolla. I quote him off and on. Now, it's like there's a limit to all of his material if you listen to him for a while, and then it starts to cycle. Mm -hmm. But he had a lot of brilliant points. Like uh, daytime television, when you and I were growing up, was all about trade schools. So if you were sick and during the day or faking it during the day, whatever he was, were, you would turn on the TV and it would be like, hey, you can learn to be a trucker. You can learn to type. You could do, you know, be a paralegal, all this stuff, right? Yeah. Now you can either get a drug or you can hire the lawyer to sue the people who gave you the drug. Right. We used to joke about that because there was one for a plumber in New York. There was a commercial uh, vocational one. And he and we'd sit there stoned, right? <laughs> and he, he'd say, remember, I can't call you. You have to make the first call. And we would just crack up from that, rolling around on the floor. I don't know why. It was the funniest thing in New York at the time, saying, you've got to make the first call. He couldn't call you. If you want to be a plumber, which we didn't want to be, but we just found that, you know, really funny. So sure. I, mean, I think he's right. I mean, look, a lot of this is payback for McCarthy in a lot of ways, too. They never got yeah. over the payback for McCarthy. You know, if you look at the Dalton, you look at the uh, Trumbo film with what's his face from Breaking Bad, uh, the one that won the Oscar a couple years ago. Cranston? More, um, Dalton Trumbo is a Hollywood 10 screenwriter, for instance. No, I meant the, the actor, Cranston? or Yeah, Cranston, yeah, who seems okay. to play everyone, LBJ, any historical. Oh, yeah, he, he's the new, oh, yeah. Cranston, right? He's, he's replaced Kevin Spacey. Right. So <laughs> in, that, in that Trumbo biopic, there are more, because I'm a, I'm a stickler. I've done a lot of biopics. I've written a lot of biopics. Mm. Eric. LBJ, RFK, Oswald. I've done a lot. Abby Hoffman. I've done a lot of biopics. And it's really hard to do. you got to be able to take factual stuff, not throw bullshit in, and fit it into a three-act structure. Very, very difficult to do. These guys, what they're using it for is political weaponry. 
Mm-hmm. So the Chumbo one, he was one of the Hollywood 10. So right. he was a die hard motherfucking communist. I mean, <laughs> there was no way you could confuse him with anything liberal. This guy, right. a complete red menace, Trumbo. You know what I mean? Was, was, it, was he like the Rosenbergs? Yeah, I, I believe it was the Rosenbergs. He was at that level, yeah, absolutely. Who, who, yeah, I mean, they, they were like, oh, it was a crime. I, I was taught in high school, and I don't know about you, that they were falsely executed, and they were evil, and it's like, turns out, oh, hell no, they were spies. Full-on spies. Look, I did a paper in college uh, that they were innocent, and they were full-on spies. I mean, you know, come on. They, I mean, these guys, you know, were, were... Here's the thing with the Hollywood screenwriters, and this is hard for people to wrap their minds around. These screenwriters were getting notes. You know how a screenwriter gets notes from the studio? Mm-hmm. And how to adjust your screenplay? No, I'm I'm guessing. I'm, I I hear, but I've, I've never done it. So okay, so you get these notes from the studio, and they're crazy notes, and you deal with them, whatever you do, right? They were getting notes from the Kremlin. Mm-hmm. Let that sink in for five seconds. What I just told you, they were Damn. getting screen notes from the history has shown this. Not then history, mm-hmm. like with the with the Rosenbergs, has right. shown us they had guys giving them notes. Jesus. From the Kremlin on how to subtly alter the message in their script to be more pro-communist. That's why McCarthy was necessary. And did they know it was from the Kremlin? And that, that's oh, the thing. Yes. I, I, uh, oh, well, because oh, some, yeah. some are idiots. I always believe in uh, Hanlon's oh, razor yeah, quite these, often. These were true believers. These were true believers. Okay. Yeah, not, not the Hollywood 10, my friend. I mean, <laughs> others might have gotten, you know, some sort of you know, notes from somewhere, but which leads me to a case of Grobert versus Spyglass. Mm -hmm. I wrote a script, uh, which became The Recruit with Colin Farrell and Al Pacino, right? Oh, somebody just probably got a point in the chat. Sorry. Now they get notes from China. He's right. That's where I was going with that because (laughs) I I was just going to go there. Take, I have a friend, Shane Black. He, he wrote Lethal Weapon. He directed Iron Man 3. Mm. And, um, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He's you know written a lot of major films with Mel Gibson, other other A list stars. So he directs Iron Man three, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of the money comes in from China, disappears. They pull the money back and they threaten the studio, saying, "If you want access to China, you'll do what we say." Okay. And what mm-hmm. is it that they want? Okay, they want to take the film. He's done with the film, right? Take the film, rewrite, and reshoot the entire third act in China as they see fit. So the director <laughs> feels, no, no, no. Here, here men have bled to death over fighting with people like Harvey Scissorhands Weinstein over editing of films and post-productions, you know, fist fights, <laughs> legal battles. The Directors Guild of America voted to allow China to recut American films as they see fit in China. So Iron Man 3 in China, has an entire separate third act to that movie. Wow. Think about that concept. Imagine if the French had it. Imagine if Germany had it. Imagine if every country in the world just cut our films to fit their political agenda, how insane this would be. That's what we're up against. This is what bothers me. Or what, I'm not going to say bother. This was what befuddles me. Mm-hmm. You live there. And is it a case, uh, Corolla said this, I'm going to keep calling him back. I apologize. But I thought it was so true. That if somebody doesn't uh, talk politics, that means they're right wing. That's Hollywood. absolutely true. That's absolutely true. You talk around it, talk baseball, talk the Dodgers. You know what I mean? There's okay. way you, you just don't, you know, you try to have some relationship. Sometimes they throw you under the bus eventually. And so, a lot of times they just want to do business with you. You know, so you, you have ways to try to avoid it. You know, I mean, look, even in 1997, I wrote a black comedy, I mean, African American comedy. And mm-hmm. I had produced Mambo Mouth in New York with John Leguizamo. I had produced Mo Funny Black Comedy in America, the definitive uh, a 90 minute documentary on the history of African American comedy for HBO, Eric. So I had bona fides in this area, even as a mm-hmm. white as a white comedy guy. So mm-hmm. I wrote a comedy uh, called Black to Africa, whatever it was, and Fox bought it from me. And they said, I said, all right, let's go to script. Let's, you know, let's get this thing going. And they said, you can't write it. I said, why not? They said, you're white, right? And I said, what? And they said, yeah, you got to go out and find a black writer. So now we're on a mission around Hollywood, me and the two producers, interviewing one black writer after another to get them to do our project as a front, as a front. And nobody exists. So we settle on a guy named Daryl Quarles, who wrote Big Mama's House, ended up hooking up with um, 
uh, Martin Lawrence later as, as his writer. We get yeah. this guy, we give him $175,000 of my money. That's a good gig. <laughs> right. <laughs> he disappears for six months, sends us a letter saying he smoked crack for six months. He's in a rehab. Sorry. That was my project. That was the end of my project. Okay. Oh, and I'm supposed to accept that because somebody's grandfather was in Mississippi in the Civil War while my family was in Poland in, you know, 1843 in a shtetl. Sure. So, it, it, it was, yeah. so, but this, this was 1997, 98, Eric. So this is not new is what I'm trying to tell you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's this is becoming... the most liberal place of the most liberal state in the most sure. liberal city and the most liberal industry. And yet they have a witch hunt within their own industry. Well, I, I mean, that's what says the left eats their own. Right. I mean, yeah. You know, the, then they came. Yeah. At, um, you know, poem. Well, uh, look, you know, I was listening to uh, Victor Davis Hanson talking about this the other day, how the Me Too movement came up to the door of Joe Biden. And they said, OK, we've gone far enough. And that now. <laughs> right. You know, because he's got 12, 13, 14 sure. women. And they said it's enough. They pulled the plug on it. And now that luckily for Cuomo, he's in a post Me Too, post Biden era. And Hansen said there may be a hundred women, but Cuomo's immune because oh, he's yeah. now he's in a post Biden. Look what happened to Cuomo? Nothing. Yeah, Nothing. Yeah. He went to the Rankin's on his ass, and his is barely anything but a joke. Exactly. But the point of the matter is, he's not Charlie no. Rose. No. Right. He's not Garrison Keillor. Nope. <laughs> he's not Mark Halpern. He's not. Well, he's also not there. Well, <laughs> there, there not there. he's not in jail. He's not Harvey Weinstein. Right. Okay. You tell me the difference between Cuomo and Weinstein. Um, he's got one Emmy. The other guy's got 20 Oscars. No, well, there is that. As long as Cuomo's Emmy's for editing. I don't know what it was for. <laughs> Press conferences. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll leave it to the pro here. <laughs> but I think it's payback for McCarthy is what I was getting at originally with this Hollywood 10 storyline. I think, it, it, look, I mean, uh, Clinton was payback for Nixon, right? Mm -hmm. It's all payback all the time. Trump was payback for Clinton. I mean, these guys have long memories. A lot of them are still alive. I, I remember when, Nate, uh, when Jerry Nadler was my congressman on when I lived on the Upper West Side and he weighed 450 pounds and I see him waddling down the street and I said I can't live here anymore so I move here and I get Adam Schiff I mean I can't win either way I've had two of the craziest congressmen in the history of the United States is we now amusing is you live in the two areas that mock everything in between as flyover country right but really, I feel that flyover country is what's the only thing that's holding things together, even tangentially. Right. And, and that's sad because it's it being is. gutted. Look, I don't know what the deal is. Did you read the Gutman letter the, um, that Barry Weiss uh, printed about the father in the private school in New York who pulled his daughter out because of the anti-racist teaching in this private school? Uh, Beersley, this $54,000 school in New York. I don't know if to read the letter. One of the most brilliant letters so far that's been written during this revolution is written by a father of a girl he's pulling out of the school. Because so I'm sure he's a racist. No, well, that's the quick answer. Is no, I mean I'm just saying that yeah, only only time I see Barry Weiss is that she's trending, and usually she's trending, and that means that she's um essentially stepped off the reservation again or whatever it is but it well eventually uh, there's going to be enough barry weiss's and matt taibis and and aaron mate's and glenn greenwald's and naomi wolves where there's just going to start to be too many of them to all be racist you know what i mean well, the, and yeah you know, fortunately what? we're carrying them the people What's are that? carrying them and that helps somebody brought this up in the chat and it's true too did you know that some woke asshole in the UK said that the Luther actor Idris Elba is not black enough because he does not eat Jamaican food? <laughs> I, I no, it's true. I that, swear. That's that, true. That Luther Luther as a show um, was not appropriately black mm -hmm. enough because it didn't have enough car of Caribbean. I think they they did say in in the eating and representation. It's like what? It's really bizarre. I, <laughs> I mean, mean it's like. Like, 
be moving the game out of Atlanta to move to a white uh, Denver. You oh, know, yeah, where they have stricter voting laws, by the way, than the ones that they're laws, protesting. Right, and, and, and a whiter culture in, in Denver than in Georgia, that's for sure, right? I mean, or how about, um, you know, in Berkeley, they gave subsidies to uh, get everybody to do solar panels. But everyone, everybody wanted to make sure that their neighbors saw them, so they put them on the wrong side of the freaking house to face the street, which was opposite of the sun. Now that's is important. People, see. that's virtue sun signaling. I like that. Oh, hey, but she got to have it. You know, it's like that's why the Prius was such a major bestseller. It's not well, that they gave say, a shit about a hybrid. It had to be a Prius. The uh, the the Hollywood the the Hollywood thing with China that I was talking to you before was very similar to what Hitler and the studios did in Germany with us all the way up to 1941. The Germans were uh, again editing our films. They were demanding Jews be removed from the projects, and Hollywood uh, was doing their bidding in 1933 to 1941. There's a number of books written about it, which you may want to pick up because it has very similar uh, tone to what's happening with China today. And we we did the same thing. We did the same thing. Well, and, political correctness was created by Mao Zedong, right? Right, but I'm, what I'm saying is the Hollywood film, the Hollywood film industry buckled to Hitler. Why wouldn't they buckle to the Chinese now? There's a history and a precedent for this. You know, I was watching the remake of Red Dawn because I'm working on a film called Blue Dawn. Oh, uh, God, the first Red Dawn, by the way, did not hold up. Oh, my I know. God. That's but I watched the second Red Dawn, <laughs> and they replaced the Chinese army. The entire thing was filmed with the Chinese army. They had to go back and reshoot it with North Koreans. Did you know that? <laughs> I knew it was supposed to be North Koreans. I vaguely remember. Okay, that, that that went down. Right, but it's originally they shot it with the Chinese invading, mm -hmm. and they had to reshoot the entire thing with uh, North Koreans and North Korean logos and take off all the Chinese stuff to get into the market. And they wouldn't let them in the market. They fucked them at the end. The Chinese. That's they actually fucked good. them. They wouldn't. Let them. That, I'm glad to hear that though, because they can't. What's that? I'm, I love hearing that because they caved. Yeah. They caved and they and they get lost anyway. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> I like that story. I like that story. They couch out. They couch out and got reamed anyway. What was it uh, John Johnson said that Hitler learned speech strategy from a hypnotist and then had him murdered? I didn't know that one, but I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know about that, I think I don't know about that. But well, I mean, he was very big yeah, I mean, in propaganda. Look, Gerbils. Three films tonight. Hitler watched three Hollywood films a night with Goebbels in his studio. I mean, the I'm amount kidding. of footage that he took in was unbelievable. How many how many Hollywood films he watched? Oh, sure. Well, wasn't we doing amphetamines? And he saw the power of cinema. No, I believe it. Okay. So, and he look, envied I mean, it. <laughs> he, he, you could make the entire argument that the entire... Um, the psychosis because they give them this uh what's essentially their version of crystal meth when they do the blitzkrieg the blitzkrieg itself is fueled mm -hmm. by crystal meth and they start writing back saying these guys are having psychotic episodes now and you could make the argument that that this butchery of the jews for instance might have been amphetamine psychosis because you see a lot of it mm -hmm. today for instance with people on crystal meth who just go Oh, we're back. Well, your timing was perfect. You actually but, yeah, froze. Yeah, I, I mean, look. You see the <laughs> crystal meth, you froze. It's like we're stuck in there. Never when you disappear. Never <laughs> you know, the, yeah, I think the entire, the Japanese had it, and the Germans had it, and the French had wine at the Maginot Line. So they drank their two bottles of wine, the French, and passed out, which didn't help, but the Blitzkrieg was rolling over them anyway, you know, all the way to Dunkirk. But after that, you know, I looked at the Eisenhower document that he signed to give our troops amphetamines. Eisenhower quickly adjusted, so did the British, to give our troops amphetamines. And on the <laughs> form, it says, I forget the exact numbers, but it said like two million doses for the U.S. Army. And he crossed it out and put 20 million. Eisenhower himself oh, and signed it with his initial. Yeah. Well, he was smart. I mean, it's like. You can't hold against them. That that's the one thing. Uh, the one fascinating thing about World War II and even one is that we didn't build a better tank, but we just kept building them. 
and we just kept coming. Right. Uh, you know, same way it's like we could afford to do twenty million. We could just afford to just keep throwing everything at it, and and that I think eventually right. tipped it because, I mean, our our tanks weren't as good. Um, nothing nope. was good, but they just kept making them. We just kept making them, kept right. coming. Right. And, right. But we and, once had a, we once had a, um, the only time we lost a lawsuit at National Lampoon was a cover we did that had an upside down Volkswagen in a bay. And it said, if Ted Kennedy had driven a Volkswagen, he'd be president today. <laughs> and it was a reference to Chappaquiddick. And Volkswagen looked at that as uh, slander and defamation. So we actually had to pay Volkswagen for that one. It's the only time we lost the suit. Damn. I wonder why you were, did you have to pay because in the European market or just I'm surprised. Um, I don't think so. It was, in other words, it was an upside down VW. Part of their, we felt the parody was they were running commercials where Volkswagens were floating. Mm -hmm. At the time, there was a campaign for some reason that sh showed that the VW bug floated. Well, they're supposed to be made to float, I think, originally. Right, right. So we said if Ted Kennedy was driving a Volkswagen, oh. he'd be president today. I thought it was pretty funny. But well, well, yeah, somehow been defamation on Ted Kennedy more. Well, <laughs> you can't, yeah, he was still alive. I was going to say you can't defame a dead man. You know, I no, remember, but th then you could. So that's. I remember funny. watching the uh, Nixon impeachment hearings in Narragansett, Rhode Island, with the uh, members of the Kennedy clan, and uh, the friend of mine lived next door. It was in the summer, I guess, of seventy four, seventy three. And we're all watching it, and a guy comes down the stairs in his underwear, right? This is a, one of their summer houses, Narragansett. And he goes, what's all the fuss about? What's going on? It's Ted Kennedy, like completely blotto in his underwear, yelling at us to shut up that he's sleeping upstairs. <laughs> God. Oh, well, uh, they were quite the clan. Well, folks, um, this is perfect. Okay. I'm actually going to ask one more main question, but this is going to be on locals. I can't believe the right. time went by. You're definitely going to be coming back because there's just too much to cover. Right. <laughs> so if, I could, if I could suggest something, we may yeah. just have individual theme shows on one subject in the future and just, just stick to one thing per show. Eric, Perfect. that's an idea. I don't know. Well, I, I, yes, I definitely, I've told everybody about you um, with the history of alcohol. And mm -hmm. I think that that's actually worth an right. episode because you've gone into that you've gone into the rehab you've gone into how it's a profiteering business in some ways or it's legitimate and you know all depends i'm also um, a drug counselor by the way i forgot to tell you i'm sorry what i'm also a drug counselor yeah you own a clinic from what i understand no i don't own a clinic or, or I ran one started one a number of years ago we started we tried to do the right thing but it, we quickly realized the business was corrupt which is I to take a legitimate drug high-end drug rehab, but it was it was too much fraud. Wow, that sucks. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. Well, for right now, we're gonna go with and I'm gonna pitch the one question to you, and we're gonna answer it in locals right so on. everybody can see ahead of time and get the answer in locals. Again, I'm not going to make it hidden behind a paywall or anything else. Anybody can join it for free. Mm -hmm. I'll put the content up. It'll take me a couple hours. I got to cut the video and stuff to get right. it. But this will be just for locals. So until then, everybody, the question is, what is it like working with Oliver Stone? <laughs>